you everyone for attending our tutorial talk on self-supervised learning. Together with my colleague John Wook from OpenAI, we're going to do a deep dive into many recent work and advances in the field of self-supervised learning. It is a very popular concept in recent years in the deep learning community as a popular paradigm of representation learning. We're going to present the work mainly from two perspectives. One is self-prediction, and the other is contrastive learning. Here you will see a brief outline of our tutorial. First, in the introduction session, we're going to go over the basic concept and the motivation, and um, also showcase a couple of very cool applications enabled by this powerful technique. Then in the early work session, we will do a quick review of several uh, old concepts. <laughs> Some of them may have been more than a decade old, and likely you have been very familiar with them, but they are actually closely connected to and inspired the core idea of self-supervised learning. In the master session, we organize the content into uh, two uh, main subsections, self-prediction and contrastive learning. And under each subsection, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna present the framework and categorization of different ideas. The pre-tech session is gonna cover a wide range of papers in the field. We group similar papers together according to the framework presented in the master session. They're not necessarily uh, presented in the chronologic order, but uh, but in a way that better to review the thought process and uh, each incremental improvement. In the future direct session, we will briefly discuss open research question and a few promising directions that we might explore more for self-supervised learning. Okay, first, so let's try to understand what is self-supervised learning and why we need it. Self-supervised learning is a special type of representation learning that enables learning good data representation from unlabeled data set. It set us in a fairly smart way such that we can use supervised learning objective um, using only the unsupervised data. Okay, um, but why we need it? Why we want to do this? The motivation is quite straightforward. <laughs> First of all, Given a task and enough labels, we know self-supervised uh, learning can often solve it really well as long as we have enough data and high quality labels. Good performance um, comes with the cost because collecting high quality, large amount label data set is very expensive. It involves a lot of human hours, um, lots of coordination, just Think about how ImageNet is collected. Um, I, I believe thousands of students um, and people all around the world get involved in order to label like million images. It's fairly hard to scale up. Um, however, on the other side, we do have a large collection of unlabeled data, such as content on the internet, digital book scans, all the YouTube videos. So we want to find a way to learn from those data. Second reason being, learning good representation makes it easier to transfer useful information to a variety of downstream tasks, especially task agnostic representation, because they benefit very different downstream tasks, so we can use it as a useful pre-training setup. In the rest of tutorial, we're going to refer to self-supervise uh, the learning task as pre-text tasks. Recent work has shown great potential for self-supervised learning to do high quality representation without explicit manual labels. Here is one cool example. Um, the video colorization work by Bondrick et al. in 2018, by only relying on the pixel level color information, their model results in a rich representation that can be used for video segmentation 
and um, unlabeled a visual region tracking without extra steps of fine tuning. The illustration um, showed on the slides uh, present two downstream tasks. The first role is uh, video segmentation tracking, and the second one is human pose tracking. For both tasks, the only labels from us human is to mark the areas we want to track or the human skeleton we want to track in the first frame. And then the model can propagate the segmentation information or human pose skeletons labeled just in the first frame throughout the rest of the video, which is fairly cool. Another example is the clip model from OpenAI. Um, clip model is trained while contrastive learning use pairs of loosely coupled text and images. Despite of not training on supervised labels, the zero shot clip classifier still achieved great performance on challenging image to text classification tasks. For example, we uh, show two pictures, guacamole with chips on top and a television studios here um, in, on the slides. The model tries to, uh, to identify which label out of five candidates should be the best caption for the images. For both cases, it, it is a bit tricky given the confusing picture or, um, or, or caption candidates. Still, our clip model is able to select the correct options with high probability. Next, my colleague John Wook will continue with a review of related work in early days. In this section, we introduce some important early work that has eventually led to self-supervised learning in the present days. The early work that we'll cover includes these ideas, which look like a somewhat random collection of machine learning buzzwords, but we think it's meaningful to briefly mention and pay tribute to what eventually led to the current popularity and success of self-supervised learning. The first one is restricted Boltzmann machines or RBMs, which is a special case of Markov random field consisting of visible units and hidden units. An RBM has connections between any pair across visible and hidden units, but not within each group. And it has been widely used as a method for unsupervised learning. RBM was first introduced by Paul Smolensky in 1986 under the name Harmonium, and it gained much popularity after Jeffrey Hinton and collaborators invented fast algorithms to train RBMs in the early 2000s. Shown on the slide is a visualization of the hidden layer connections learned by an RBM using the MNIST dataset. Greedy layer-wise pre-training is a strategy for training deep neural networks by first training an RBM in each layer, and the learned weights of the RBM are transferred to initialize a feed-forward neural network. Since the introduction of this technique in 2006, this was the standard for deep model training for quite a few years afterwards. At the time, the expression unsupervised pre-training used to mean exactly this practice with RBMs. And it is interesting to see the recent renaissance of the same unsupervised pre-training and then fine-tuning approach in self-supervised methods today. Autoencoders are another unsupervised learning method that was a precursor to the modern self-supervised approaches. Specifically, denoising autoencoders introduced by Pascal Vincent et al. in 2008 learns to predict denoised images given noisy versions of them. In the data manifold perspective, denoising autoencoders learn the knowledge about the data distribution by learning to push the points that are off the data manifold back onto the data manifold, as shown in this figure. 
This approach has inspired many self-supervised learning approaches in later years, most representatively by mask language models like BERT, which, will be, which we will discuss later in this tutorial. The noising objectives inspired the famous word to vec method that eventually evolved into the powerful language models we see today. CBOW, or a continuous bag of words, learns an embedding for each word such that the sum of neighboring word embeddings is predictive of the word in the middle. Somewhat similarly, the skipgram model tries to learn word embedding vectors that are predictive of the neighboring words embeddings. An alternative word to web method called GLOBE uses global co word co-occurrence statistics to learn a vector representation of each word. An interesting phenomenon resulting from these word to web approaches is that you can observe linear substructures in the embedding space where the lines connecting comparable concepts, such as the corresponding masculine and feminine words, appear in roughly parallel lines. It allows you to do an arithmetic between words like king minus man plus woman, which would likely land close to queen. Another family of unsupervised learning approaches that inspired many of recent self-supervised methods is autoregressive modeling. In autoregressive modeling, the met model predicts each element of the data, sample conditioned on the previous elements, where the individual conditional distributions are easier to model than the data distribution as a whole. Hidden Markov models or recurrent neural networks are historical examples based on the concept of autoregressive modeling. A more recent and relevant prior work is the Neural Autoregressive Distribution Estimator, or NAID, which uses a neural network to model the conditional distribution. An advantage of the autoregressive approaches over the denoising objectives is that the learned models can uh, be directly used to generate samples of data. As in these MNIST samples, which was amazing in the 2011 standard. Autoregressive modeling also has been a basis for many self-supervised methods, such as GPT and Jukebox, which we will go into details shortly. Many of today's contrastive self-supervised learning methods use a pair of neural networks and learn from their differences. This idea can tra be traced back to the early 90s. Becker and Hinton introduced self-organizing neural networks where two neural networks take separate but related parts of the input and learn to maximize the agreement between the two outputs. Based on the similar ideas, the 1994 paper from Jan LeCun's group introduced the term Siamese network and used it for verifying handwritten text recognition. We will dive deeper into these networks in the context of contrastive learning. Additionally, these predecessors of the, the predecessors of the recent contrastive learning techniques can be found in the literature using terms like multiple instance learning and metric learning. These methods deviate from the typical framework of empirical risk minimization, which minimizes a loss function evaluated separately on the labeled examples. And instead, they define the objective function in terms of multiple samples from the data set, hence the name multiple instance learning. Earlier work in this space was around nonlinear dimensional reduction, such as the multi-dimensional scaling, MDS, or locally linear embedding, which aimed to be better than PCA at preserving the local structure of data samples. These approaches are often associated with a learned metric, which is a function of two data points that works like a distance measure, hence called metric learning. Sin et al. originally considered a Euclidean distance metric in a space transformed using a learnable positive semi-definite matrix A, the contrastive loss by Chopra and Hatzel et al. used a spring system to decrease the distance between the same types of inputs and increase between different types of inputs. The triplet loss is another way to obtain a learned metric, which is defined using three data points, which we call anchor, 
positive and negative. The anchor point is learned to become similar to the positive point and dissimilar to the negative point. The triplet loss can be generalized to n pair loss when multiple negative samples are used in order to more efficiently train the model. The majority of recent contrastive learning approaches uses an instantiation of the n pair loss. So far, we did a quick tour of early work. These were initially developed independently, but then researchers connected the dots and developed many self-supervised learning approaches of today, many of which will be covered in this tutorial. Now, to continue, Lillian will introduce two major approaches to self-supervised learning. Now I'm going to discuss the technical details and methods of how self-supervised learning tasks are created. We will summarize the main categorization of pretext task concepts under two groups, self-prediction and contrastive learning, respectively. First, let's look at self-prediction. Self-prediction tasks can be set up per individual sample. Usually, we pretend one part of the sample is missing and try to predict the missing part given the rest information about the same sample. For example, given a full image, you can mask a random patch in it and pretend you don't know what pixels are under the patch, then ask the model to predict what it is. However, since you in fact know the true target, the supervised learning loss can be adopted accordingly. Differently, the contrastive learning pretext tasks are designed to predict relationships between multiple samples, mainly aiming to learn which samples are similar to each other and which are not. Similar to self-prediction, this setup assumes that we know the true relationship between samples but pretend to not know it. The relationship can be based on inner logics within the data, such as word sequence in text corpus or different camera views of the same scene. Another popular approach is to create multiple augmented versions of the same sample without changing the semantic meanings, and then those augmented versions should share similar representation. First, let's delve into uh, self-prediction pretext tasks. <laughs> okay, I'm showing a very famous illustration here. I assume anybody who has known something about self-supervised learning probably has run into this um, very famous figure um, from Yan Lequin. Uh, it demonstrates how flexible and diverse the options we have for constructing self-prediction learning tasks. Data often comes with one or multiple dimensions, some including the time dimension. And we can slide the feature space in various ways to select a portion of the data in one or multiple dimensions as prediction target, as shown in blue, while keeping the rest as input feature, as shown in magenta color. We briefly group self prediction methods into four subcategories they are autoregressive generation, masked generation in a relationship prediction and hybrid self-prediction. Autoregressive generation, as the name implies, depends on autoregressive modeling. Any data comes with an init sequence order on one dimension, we can configure the pretext task to predict the future given all the past information. For example, both audio and language have a, a time sequencing order Images are often perce uh, processed in raster scan order, which also gives you a deterministic sequence order of pixels. For all the examples, we will present more details on some representative work um, on the following session on pretext tasks. Next subcategory um, is mask generation. It is quite similar to autoregressive, but um, we usually try to hide a random portion of information irrespective of the inner order. The mask is um, 
usually applied at random, as scattered noise, or random patches. The most intuitive example include predict, um, predicting random words based on other words in the same context around it in the language modeling domain, or mask random patches in image to predict uh, in order to recover the entire image. Another special case of self-prediction is to apply transformation on the, on the sample without modifying its semantic meaning or segment the sample in a way that different chunks of information have to follow a known natural order or logic. For example, researchers propose to segment an image into multiple patches and shuffle the patches in order to play a jigsaw puzzle game. Or rotating an image should not alter a semantic meaning, but learning to predict which direction of the rotation has been applied helps us or how helps the representation model to capture high level object parts. Um, the last category is the hybrid uh, self prediction approach. It combines different type of generation modeling together. For example, VQGAN model combines CNN based VQVAE to learn a discrete codebook of context rich visual parts, together with a transformer model that is trained to auto regressively modeling the color combination of this codebook. Next session, uh, let's look into contrastive learning. The goal of contrastive representation learning is to learn an embedding space which similar samples pairs stay close to each other while dissimilar ones are fall apart. Contrastive learning can be applied to both supervised and unsupervised settings. When working with unsupervised data, contrastive learning is one of the most powerful approach in the uh, self-supervised learning. We briefly group contrastive learning methods into three subcategories. Uh, they are intersample classification, feature clustering, and multiple coding. Among them, intersample classification is the most dominant approach. We name it intersample as we want to emphasize um, or distinguish it from intrasample missing information prediction as we just uh, introduced for self-prediction setup. To frame it as a classification task, the model is given both similar and dissimilar candidates and asked to identify which ones are actually similar to the anchor data point. Uh, we usually refer similar ones as positive samples and dissimilar ones as negative ones. There are creative ways to construct a set of data points candidates um, for contrastive learning. For example, we can take the original input as anchor and apply a set of transformations to create distorted versions. Since the transformation intend to keep the semantic meanings unchanged, the distorted version should be viewed as positive samples. In the multi-view multi coding setup, data that capture the same target from different views are considered as positive samples, as they refer to the same object, no matter how different the, the presentation might look like. Since this is a classification task, of course, uh, we can use class entropy loss. Um, but in the same time, there are uh, a couple of variations that have been designed specifically for the contrastive learning setup. Now let's investigate each of them in details. Uh, contrastive, learn contrastive loss is one of the earliest training objects used for deep metric learning in a contrastive fashion. Uh, you do need to know a ground truth binary label, for example, which can be something from a label data set like uh, ImageNet or something fabricated with uh, data augmentation, depending on whether the class label Y, I, and Y, J are same, the contrastive loss will minimize the distance between I, uh, X, I, and X, J if they share the same class. Otherwise, uh, uh, the object 
will try to minimize the distance in the embedding space if the classes are different. Triple, triple loss is another very classic um, loss. Um, it was uh, introduced in the face net paper, a uh, very classic paper in 2015. It is designed to do face recognition of the same person given the input of images at different poses and angles. It is named a triplet loss because it demands an input triplet containing one anchor, one positive, and one negative. The loss computes the distance from the anchor to the positive and negative points respectively, and then try to minimize the difference such that the anchor, uh, the anchor to positive distance is always shorter. Okay, um, next one is impaired loss. Um, and parallel loss generalize the triplet loss to include comparison with multiple negative samples. The input is a n plus one triplet of training samples, including one anchor, one positive, and n minus one negative samples. The loss function maximizes the ratio between positive samples dot products over the sum of all other uh, dot products. Uh, between the like, anchors and uh, other other samples. And, um, and now like uh, we are running a lot of large scale trainings and often the time the batch size is very large. Um, which means we're gonna have many samples within one batch and therefore we can construct multiple similar or dissimilar pairs a uh, lifted structure loss is proposed to utilize all the pairwise edges of relationship within one training batch. It explicitly minimizes the distance between positive pairs and, uh, and maximize all the, the log sum expose, sorry, minimize the log sum expose of uh, the re reverse of all the negative pair distances. This setup uh, helps improve compute efficiency as it uh, incorporates more information within one batch. Um, next one, uh, you might heard of it already. Uh, it's a uh, noisy contrastive estimation, NCE. It was initially proposed to learn word embedding in uh, 2010, so that's quite a while ago. The core idea is to run logistic regression to distinguish between target and noise data. The logic is defined as the uh, logarithm of the ratio between target sample distribution P and the noise distribution Q. If we start with a simple cross entropy loss and then plug into the logic, we will get the NCE loss here. Info and CE um, was originally proposed in the contrastive predictive coding paper to model the audio signal. In, um, it, it uses the categ categorical cross entropy loss to identify the positive sample among a set of unrelated noise samples with consideration of a sample distribution conditioned on a context vector C. Given a context vector C, the positive sample should be drawn from the condition distribution Px given C, while n minus one negative samples are drawn from the proposal distribution Px independent from the context C. The probability of detecting the positive sample correctly is as shown on the slide. Soft nearest neighbor loss extends the loss function to inc include multiple positive samples given non-labels. This non-labels may come from supervised data set or fabric, uh, fabricated with uh, data augmentation, as I mentioned before. The loss function contains a, tem a temperature uh, factor tau, which is used for tuning how concentrated the feature space are uh, or the features are in the representation space. For example, when at low temperature, 
The loss is dominated by the small distances and widely separated representations cannot contribute much and become irrelevant. Okay, um, since contrastive learning aims um, to pull similar samples together and dissimilar ones far apart, naturally, we will expect to see clusters of similar data points emerged in the representation space. Uh, this gave us uh, the ideas on the second categories under uh, contrastive learning. Uh, that is, uh, we can use feature clustering to create uh, similar or dissimilar pairs. The core idea of feature clustering approach is to apply uh, an unsupervised clustering algorithm like KNN to assign pseudo labels to samples based on uh, the current embedding you have, which is probably immature or is still in training progress. And then uh, we rely on the inner sample classification setup to further improve the embedding representation. Uh, you can imagine you do this clustering and construct contrastive training alternatively or like in sync in parallel. The, the third category uh, within contrastive learning is <clears throat> uh, multi-view coding. To some extent, it is a special version of inner sample class classification with, um, it has a special emphasis on the data collection procedure. Data points for multi-view coding are collected from different view viewpoints about the same object. For example, um, you it can be images. Uh, imagine you have a vision task. Um, you have a 3D setup, and you can set up like camera at different positions and capture the same scene uh, at the same time, but from different cameras. Then you you will have like maybe drastically different images, but it's all about the same uh, same setup. Uh, when working with audio data, another example is uh, you can represent the same audio signals in different representation format. Uh, they can be treated as different view of the same data as well. Okay, um, going further with multiple coding, a uh, different view of the same object can be paired between uh, two or uh, multiple modalities. Um, for example, uh, the, for the click model, it's, it's uh, the classic example of this. Well, text and image that naturally appear close to each other on the internet are considered as uh, positive pairs for contrastive learning. In other cases, like, um, code and natural language in either as like search query or doc string within the code can be paired together to learn good representation for uh, semantic code search or other like uh, programming language related task. Okay, um, next um, we might take a break maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, my my colleague John Wook will continue the talk with the next section on pretext tasks. Thank you for your attention so far. Hi everyone, and welcome to the NeurIPS 2021 tutorial on self-supervised learning. Uh, I'm Erin Grant, and I'm joined right now by Lillian Wang and Jung Wook Kim from OpenAI um, for a 10-minute Q&A period. And so we're taking questions live in the Rocket Chat. So if you have any clarification or more philosophical questions, please go ahead and ask them in the Rocket Chat and we'll try to get to them, if not in this Q&A, in the next Q&A. Um, so I'll start with some, some broad questions that came up in the Rocket Chat so far. So one question is, um, so you guys gave a really nice categorization of self-supervised learning methods, breaking them into contrastive learning and self-prediction. Um, now, given your experience doing that, do you think that that's all there is in terms of self-supervised learning methods, or exactly what was the motivation between uh, for this uh, breakup? I think we can say that there are two most popular 
very broad approaches and most of the self-supervised learning um, that uh, is being developed can be classified very largely into these two, but um, there are of course intricacies and um, there are some algorithms that uh, um, applies both approaches and some are not corresponding to uh, uh, either. So we will go into those um, little bit, the, the taxonomy in a little more detail in the later sections in this talk. Okay, great. And as like a quick follow-up on that, do you think that it gives a, a useful way to kind of generate new algorithms if we can think of all of the existing self-supervised learning methods as one of these two approaches, and then they each have like specific ways of modifying um, either doing self-prediction or contrastive learning. Is it a good way for people to think about coming up with new self-supervised learning methods? Um, this is currently, I guess, the most like um, well popular approaches, but um, I don't, I can tell if the future will stay this way. So it can tell too strongly, but um, in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, developing new algorithms, I think it'll be, help it'll be helpful to look into more domain specific um, ideas. Uh, for example, Baller Twins was uh, looking, uh, was uh, based on uh, principles in neuroscience and efficient coding theory uh, to, uh, to develop a new uh, algorithm that is similar to uh, contrastive learning, but not exactly. So those kind, be, those kind of approaches will be a new insight. Okay, great. Um, okay, moving on to another question that came up. Um, so in a sense, self-supervised learning is just a reframing of unsupervised learning as a supervised learning problem. Um, so in supervised learning, we usually require a little bit of additional data. In unsupervised learning, um, it usually requires us to model the whole input. And there seems to be a bit of magic in doing something in between, modeling just part of the input. Um, why do you think that's a useful sort of inductive bias or a general purpose representation learning method for a lot of tasks we care about? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I personally think this is a really interesting question uh, because actually when I was preparing the uh, tutorials, I was thinking, oh, why we apply this kind of augmentation but not other um, by distorting uh, distort the information or, or the input in certain ways, we actually introduce our expert opinions into what information is important versus not. Uh, so sometimes the decision can be a bit uh, based on heuristic, in my opinion. Um, but on the other ha hand, there, there are a bunch of work like try to find the best uh, data augmentation or randomization using like Neural arch architecture search type of way, like a random org, uh, org augment, random org, and there, there, I don't remember exactly name, but there are a bunch of these algorithms and just provide a, a, a long list of uh, augmentation candidates and let the model to figure out. And in that sense, the model will learn the best combination that benefits the downstream task the most. Um, and I, I, uh, I would say uh, no matter what type of augmentation we applied, we are introduced a certain inductive bias, uh, but this is also why the machine learning model can work. And in terms of representation, um, probably, um, if you look at a popular downstream task, um, for example, if I look at image tasks, a lot of them are related to um, the categorization of the object uh, or identify the same. And with that, if, the, if rudimentary, <laughs> if fundamentally that's about the type of objects, then small change on the color scheme or little like Gaussian noise wouldn't change the prediction and the representation would still be useful. But if I have a downstream task to identify a, a, a color of a certain pixel, I wouldn't think Gaussian noise would work. Um, actually in our final sections talking about uh, future directions and future work, we did mention we need more theory uh, looking into why certain augmentation can give us better representation versus others. 
So this is uh, indeed an interesting question, an interesting area. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I guess um, a related question that came, just came up in the chat. Um, is there a way in which people have empirically selected an appropriate loss for a specific use case? Or do you think this is, um, there's either going to be a sort of overarching theory telling us what to do that you maybe hint to in the later section, or is it really a domain specific engineering of inductive bias problem? Um, I don't have a good answer at the moment. Um, the, the list of losses, um, um, I kind of look them in, in time and see why people come up with certain losses. Usually it's because um, I want to increase the throughput of the model training um, or I, there is a certain limitation of the hardware so I have to make this kind of choices. Um, I would say um, in more than days with together with improvements in how uh, like large scale uh, training par uh, par parallelism trainings got improved all the techniques. We actually have more um, choices in, in terms of which loss we want to use. Um, usually I, I would propose to go with like a simple thing, easy to scale up. Um, and, and try to avoid like complicated engineering in code. Okay. Um, speaking of scaling things up, it seems that um, there are trade-offs in terms of both the supervision that some of these pretext tasks require and also the computational overhead. So one of the questions in the chat is, um, what's the trade-off between, say, collecting high-quality labels for supervised learning versus doing something like collecting multiple views of an object if you want to solve a pretext task, like uh, multi-view prediction? And relatedly, do you see a benefit from using uh, sort of naturalistic data in the sense of having actually collecting multiple views of an object or simply um, generating more data through some data augmentation like Gaussian noise? Um, let me think. Um, so yeah, there's a different kind of cost uh, around this. Uh, so depending on the availability, um, depending on the specific domain of the data set, you might uh, find it easier to collect more um, human labeled data or um, for, for things like um, human generated text, you can easily find it around the internet, but things like medical data, uh, it might be easier to um, collaborate with some um, hospitals uh, to collect human label data better. So th those are the usual trade-offs that we uh, constantly consider. And um, it could also depend on the algorithm. So if the model um, is um, involves some behavior of cloning uh, or reinforcement learning based on human feedback, uh, those will uh, require some specific types of human label data, but not too much, hopefully, um, as the model assumes. Yeah, I guess that's uh, some of the trade-offs that we can answer. Okay, and I think I'll wrap up with just one more question because we're almost out of time. Um, so two questions in the chat are related to overfitting and generalization. So in the context of self-supervised learning where we mostly care about a downstream task, have you observed any sort of overfitting in terms of uh, overfitting to the pretext task? And what does good generalization look like if we want to evaluate our self-supervised learning methods? If you look at uh, most of the evaluation in uh, self-supervised learning papers, um, people usually consider uh, several like different families of downstream tasks and pick a couple typical ones in each categories and track the performance. So people do care about the diversity of downstream tasks for, for good representation. Uh, I do think the choice of your uh, representation learning uh, model, it's fairly important um, because um, I can 
I can give you examples, not exactly on self-supervised learning, but uh, uh, I believe uh, people have studied to learn the representation use ImageNet classification task, consider that as a, a pre-training, and then try the model on cocoa object detection. Uh, and the result, uh, the performance is actually not good because your uh, pre-training task is so different from the downstream task, the representation fails to capture the gist. Um, so for good self supervised learning model, you do, um, we do recommend to look into a very diverse set of tasks. And there are quite a lot of benchmark on this. Um, if you follow the recent papers, you will find um, a lot of data sets on that. Okay, great. Um, I think we're at time for this Q&A. So if um, the audience uh, would like to join us for the next Q&A, that's gonna happen in about 33 minutes at 618 PST. So see you there.
This section will cover the specific kinds of pretext tasks in more detail that are used for self-supervised learning. First, let's recap what pretext tasks are. This diagram shows how a self-supervised learning is typically done. We first pre-train a model with a self-supervised objective, which solves a pretext task that can be defined without having a label data. As the name suggests, pretext tasks are usually not what we actually want to do with the model, but it allows for self-supervised learning on a large unlabeled data set. And the pre-trained model can then be transferred to perform various downstream tasks with little to no additional training. There are a myriad of such pretext tasks for self-supervised learning, and it might be daunting to simply list them individually. So shown here on the slide is an attempt to classify the pretext tasks in, into four interrelated categories. The first one is generative approaches, where a good representation is learned by training a model to generate new samples of data. Rather than generating complete samples, the next category, sub-prediction, learns to predict only a portion of a sample conditional on another part of the sample. The third category is formulating a classification problem using some innate relationship from the data, such as the relative positions or rotations of image patches. The idea of posing a classification problem from the data is a basis of contrastive learning, our fourth category. Contrastive learning learns good representation by contrasting the encoded features from different views and or different instances. Many of these pretext tasks are applicable to different modalities like vision, natural language, audio, and video, and we'll review what those are in detail, focusing on vision first, which is the modality that initiated much of these advances. Perhaps the most well-known category of pretext tasks for vision is image generation, thanks to VAEs and GANs. Image generation itself is an immensely broad field that deserves an entire tutorial or more, so we won't delve into too much detail, but we'll very briefly mention some major approaches for image generation that can serve as representation learning. First, VAEs by Kingma et al. is a Bayesian approach to autoencoding, where the decoder model generates data conditionally on a latent variable z and an encoder model is jointly trained to infer the latent variable given a data point. The latent representation learned in this way captures the data manifold, as you can see on the right, and has been used for transfer learning for images. Generative adversarial networks, or GANs, are perhaps the most successful image generation techniques so far. Although the GAN generator takes a value from the latent space to generate a data sample, the original GAN formulation by Goodfellow et al. did not include an encoder that can invert the generator and perform inference on the latent space given a data sample. BIGAN and ALI are concurrent models that jointly trained an encoder model in addition to the generator which can then be used to obtain representations of any given input. More recently, many GAN inversion methods have been proposed, which provides a way to perform inference in a trained GAN model. These models usually work by learning an encoder model separately or using optimization to find the latent vector that matches the input sample according to the generator. Autoregressive modeling for images typically goes in each pixel in each row, also called the raster scan order, to autoregressively generate pixels. These include the aforementioned made estimator, as well as Pixar RNN and Pixel CNN that uses RNNs and CNNs respectively to predict pixel values conditioned on the neighboring pixels. 
A more recent model from OpenAI called ImageGPT uses a transformer on discretized pixels and was able to obtain better representations than competing self-supervised approaches. Another family of methods for image generation worth mentioning is diffusion generative models. Diffusion is a process of gradually adding noise to a sample until it becomes completely unstructured noise. Diffusion generative models learns the inverse of this process so that one can start with a white noise and gradually apply the model to the noise and arrive at a new data sample. Recent diffusion models can generate very realistic samples comparable to the best GAN based generations shown here on the slide. Diffusion models operate on continuous input values and it can also be applied to other modalities such as audio generation. Those samples from generative models look amazing, but for representation learning, pretext tasks don't have to be full image generation. Instead, these models learn to generate some portions of the image that are masked using some patterns. In denoising order encoders, we mask random pixels from the image and train the model to reconstruct the hidden pixels. In context autoencoder, we mask a random rectangular region in the image and train the model to reconstruct the inner part or in paint the context. Context autoencoder is further improved by employing an uh, adversarial loss, which tries to make it difficult to distinguish between the in-painting produced by the model and the actual image. Masked prediction can not only be on the pixel value itself, but also on any subset of information from the image. For example, in the image colorization model by Zhang et al, learns to colorize an image by predicting the color in the LAB color space. In the follow-up work, Split Brain Autoencoder, the model has two parts for converting between the luminosity and the color back and forth, and also has a version that cycles between the RGB image and the depth mapping in order to get representation that transfer well to downstream tasks. Another kind of pretext task is rather than predicting information on the individual pixels to construct a classification problem that requires learning the innate relationship within the image. For example, Dorsch et al. in 2015 proposed a context prediction problem to determine the location of a patch relative to another patch, like predicting the patch marked with the number eight considering the content of the image should be located at the lower right of the yellow square. A similar idea called Jigsaw predicts the correct permutation order of image patches to get their arrangements right, like solving a Jigsaw puzzle. More methods to learn representation from the innate relationship within images include the ROTNET model that predicts which among the four possible rotations is applied to the original image, and representation learning by learning to count that learns a function that counts visual primitives in images based on the idea that feature counts are equivalent to tiling image patches. That is, if you add up the number of primitives like the number of eyes in each image patch, it should equal the number of eyes in the, in, in the large image. Contrasted predictive coding, or CPC, combines the patch level relationship learning with a contrastive objective where an autoregressive context predictor is used to classify the correct future patches in the rest of scan order among random patches from other images from the batch. This becomes a classification problem of selecting the correct instance among the n inputs in the batch, so the loss function is essentially the cross-entropy function on n-way classification. The authors further proves that minimizing this loss function is equivalent to maximizing a lower bound to the mutual information between the predicted context CT and the future patch xt plus k 
hence the name Info and CE. CPC has been highly influential in contrastive learning, showing the effectiveness of posing the problem as an inter-sample classification task. An earlier example of inter-sample classification models is instance-level discrimination or instdisc, which kind of started the recent stream of self-supervised visa models. The main idea can be traced back to exemplar CNN in 2014, where each instance in the training set served as a distinct class of its own. The instdisc model scaled this idea to image net scale datasets with millions of training images, which would require a million way classification. They achieved this by introducing a number of techniques to overcome the computational compl complexity of the enormous classification problem. One of the techniques is the memory bank, which contains caches of the image features computed from previous batches. They are used as the target for classifying the image features into each instance, rather than recomputing the image features for the entire dataset every time. As the model trains, it learns to scatter the feature vectors in the hypersphere while mapping visually similar images into closure regions in the feature space. This is possible thanks to the non-parametric softmax operation, which produces the class probabilities by, ta by taking the dot product between the encoded feature vectors, V, instead of the conventional method of using a classification layer with a learnable weight matrix to map the representation into class probabilities. They were also one of the first to use the temperature scaling parameter tau, and this is essentially equivalent to the info NCE loss of CPC which is used by the majority of more recent contrastive learning methods. Let's think about the contrastive objective in a general sense. We can say that a common approach is to have multiple views of the same input data. In case of the CPC model, the views were created by features encoded from past and future patches of the input. And in the instdisc model, it was image features computed using previous versions of model under training versus ones encoded by the current model. Then the model is trained to perform inter-sample classification, where the model has to classify the different views from the same input as similar or positive, and those from different images as dissimilar or negative. A question that arises naturally is that, is there any better way to create those views? As an answer to that question, the AMDIM model was one of the first to apply data augmentation as a means to create multiple views from one input image. The features of one of the two views are compared to the features encoded from the other view. Inspired by the split brain model, Contrastive multi-view coding creates multiple views by taking different color channels or semantic segmentation labels of the image as different views from a single image. Pretext invariant representation learning, or PAL, is another contrastive approach that applies jigsaw style patch level permutation as an input transform. Momentum contrast, or MOTO, is developed by Kai Minghe's team at FAIR and improved upon the idea of the instdisc model by using a FIFO cube of data samples as the memory bank instead of keeping the entire data set worth of features and computing the target image features using a momentum encoder, which is an exponential moving average of the encoder that is being trained. Merkel achieved the state of the art in unsupervised feature learning, and the group has been announcing improved versions of Merkel, where in version 2, they improved the performance by applying stronger data augmentation. And in version 3, they replaced the ResNet with a vision transformer and dropped the memory bank in favor of using in batch negatives. SimCRL from Google Brain simplifies even more upon Moco's framework by removing the momentum encoder and making the frame a fully symmetric. 
also by using large batches that have a sufficient number of negative inputs. SimCLR does not require a memory bank either. In the follow-up work SimCLR v2, they reintroduced the memory bank motivated by Mocha v2, but interestingly, the memory bank was removed in Mocha v3. The latest trend is to use negative samples within the batch given the improvement in the hardware to allow for large batch sizes and the simplicity of the implementation without a uh, memory bank. Valo Twins by Spontar et al. uses the similar Siami structure, but the pretext task is not intersample classification like MoCo or SimCLR. Instead, inspired by the efficient coding theory by Horace Valo, the model is optimized to make the empirical cross correlation of the features as diagonal as possible. This is because if the individual features are efficiently coded, they shouldn't be encoding information that is redundant between any pairs, so their correlation should be zero. There are self supervised vision models that use Siamese networks but are not contrastively classifying between samples or features. Instead, the objective is just minimizing the L2 distance between features encoded from the same image. There is no explicit repulsion in the loss function, unlike the other contrastive methods. Bootstrap your own latent, or BYOL, uses the momentum encoder like MoCo, and is still able to achieve SOTA level representation quality without contrastive terms. SimCM further simplified BYOL's setup by removing the momentum encoder and showed that large batch size is not required either. A caveat that is worth mentioning is that both models have batch normalization layers, which might be implicitly providing contrastive learning signal. Another major technique for self-supervised learning is to learn from clusters of features. The deep cluster model is trained by alternating between clustering and classification phases. In the clustering phase, the training data set is mapped to the feature space and clustered using the k-means algorithm. And then in the classification phase, the model is trained to classify the cluster assignments for the input images. Therefore, the cluster assignments are serving as pseudo labels. There is also an online version of the deep cluster model, which updates the clustering and classifier simultaneously to reduce the fluctuation in training caused by alternating between clustering and classification. Prototypical cluster learning, or PCL, further improved this idea by using an online EM algorithm for clustering and combining the objective with the info NCE loss. The Sella and Swap models use a similar idea. They use a clustering algorithm based on optimal transport called Syncon NOP to learn a set of prototype vectors C and find the cluster assignment to each feature vector. The first approach, Sella, performs the clustering offline and trains the model using the discrete cluster assignments as the labels. It is similar to deep cluster in that it alternates between the clustering and classification phases. The second approach, SWAP, does the clustering online and uses soft cluster assignments instead. Starting from two augmented images in the usual Siamese architecture, the model is trained to use the image feature Z to predict the cluster assignment Q in the other column has named swapping assignments between multiple views. In these approaches, novel ideas based on clustering were designed to be used in conjunction with other self-supervised learning methods. The positive pairs in contrastive learning are usually obtained by applying different augmentation to the same input. The inter-CLR model aims to improve upon that by constructing positive pairs from different images as well using pseudo labels obtained from an online k means clustering algorithm. Divide and contrast is a three step approach uh, which first uses k means clustering to divide the feature space of the uh, trained model into five to 10 groups and train expert models in each of those groups 
and then perform distillation to combine the base and expert models into a single model. These approaches are shown to improve the performance of other self-supervised learning models like MoCo or BYOL. NNCLR proposes a simpler method for drawing positive pairs from different images, where it finds the nearest neighbors of image features to serve as positives in contrastive learning. An interesting result from this work is that it required lighter data augmentation, where it observed minimal drop in performance even when it only used random cropping as data augmentation. This wasn't the case for SimCLR or BYOL, which rely significantly on the data augmentation. This is especially encouraging since the requirement image-specific data augmentation has been an obstacle for contrastive learning to be applied in broader domains. There have also been approaches to combine self-supervised learning with supervised learning such as S4L, which combines rotation prediction as the self-supervised objective, in addition to image classification on labeled data as supervised objective. Unsupervised data augmentation, or UDA, is a framework for applying data augmentation on unlabeled data by enforcing consistency between features encoded with and without data augmentation. This allows for training jointly on labeled and on unlabeled data, uh, and was used as a key ingredient of the noisy fusion models that achieved the state of the art in image classification. Supervised contrastive loss or SUPCON applies the influence E loss in a fully supervised setting and performs better than the usual cross entropy loss for a number of data sets. And it is also shown to be less sensitive to hyperparameter choices. And that was a whirlwind tour of the pre-text tasks on vision. And I took the taxonomy tree again to review what we covered. We saw generative models that predict the whole or a part of the data. And we also saw how one can pose a classification problem without labels and predict the innate relationship of the input or perform contrastive learning to obtain transferable representations. After the break, we are looking to how these approaches are applied to other modalities than vision. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the second Q&A for the, the NERVS 2021 tutorial on self-supervised learning. I'm again with Lian Wang and Jun Wu Kim. Um, and we're taking questions in the rocket chat. So I have a few lined up, but if you have a burning question, please feel free to put it there and I'll try to get to it in the 10 minutes. Um, okay, so in this section, there were quite a dizzying number of self-supervised learning methods. So thanks a lot for summarizing all of those. Um, do you have a sense of there being underlying algorithmic improvements in this lineage? And do you see something related to performance trends that are maybe um, revealing some underlying principles that we should be using? Um, yeah, so after the, uh, the C PC paper, the uh, the loss function itself has been mostly like unified to the influence loss, which is a form of cross entropy loss. Uh, but apart from this, some uh, uh, much algorithmic efforts to improve the efficiency of uh, interactive learning or self supervised learning in general has been um, proposed, um, such as how to initialize the model better and um, how to uh, collect those negative samples uh, in more efficient way. And there are, I mean, I'm sure there are much, many more papers that I'm not aware of in this direction. And some of those will be uh, discussed in more detail in the technique section uh, in the next part. And in terms of performance trends, and I cannot mention specific metrics, but the general trend is that uh, self-supervised learning models are typically trained with large scale data set. So it, tends to generalize better to broad data distribution. And um, a general rule uh, when you're reading uh, papers on these models is that uh, if you just use the pre-trained model, um, it uh, typically performs worse than supervised model that are trained specifically for certain metric. Uh, and you usually fine tune the pre-trained model um, in supervised setting. 
Um, and sometimes it performs better than a uh, simple supervised model trend with just that data set. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question is about structured data. So other than predicting, say, a missing column, column in an image, are there any self-supervised techniques, techniques specifically applicable to structured data? For example, somebody mentions um, monocular 3D reconstruction or dealing with relational data that might be used um, in the context of a graph neural network? Um, first of all, I have to admit that I'm not an expert uh, on structured data learning or graph neural, uh, graph neural network models. Um, in my, um, but it, if there is a way to represent your structured data into say a matrix or a multi-dimensional um, structure, you can apply all kinds of um, techniques we have seen so far, like like random, just random dropout mask or structured dropout, like remove or, or hide a column or all the ideas related to images like uh, that consider pixel structure can be similarly applied. Um, um, but if there's no easy way to represent your structured data, um, likely it depends on if, if you have to use a, a graph structure to represent it. Um, I'm sure there are uh, lots of papers looking into that. Um, okay, thanks. Um, and then related to specific applications, somebody asked, are there vision pretext tasks that are particularly useful for reinforcement learning downstream tasks like robotic control? Okay. Um, I would say all the, like, first of all, all the, uh, uh, all the self surprise learning models on vision tasks should be helpful. But specifically for robotic control, uh, I, I personally am a big fan of a paper called Time Contrastive Network uh, by, uh, from uh, people at Google Brain. Um, they, they apply multi-view coding into robotic uh, vision uh, pers perspective problems. Um, this is uh, multiple codings, especially useful for robotics because at the real world, often the time you need to set up cameras at different different angles to capture the scene or the object. So it naturally happens that you need to, uh, you, you, you need to capture such data and in order to better represent the 3D world and those data give you an advantage of applying multiple coding um, as part of your self surprise learning uh, pre-training. Okay. Um, somebody asks a bit of a clarification question on one of the categorizations. So about this, the categories of contrastive learning, uh, intersample classification, feature clustering, multi-view coding, I think uh, this person thinks that they're somehow overlapping. For example, info MCE multi-view coding is doing something like intersample classification. I totally agree. Um, I would say um, a lot of modeling um, of learning st structured um, under multiple coding is like a special case for under intersample classification, but I still keep it as independent section because um, for multiple coding, you need to prepare at the beginning of data, uh, data collection stage. Um, you need to intentionally gather data at different views for your objects or prepare your data, like representing the same data points in different representation form. So that's, um, that feels, uh, in my opinion, it's like a slightly different mindset and, and uh, compared to you, you get the data already and apply different uh, augmentation. But I, I totally agree, um, it's, uh, there, there are overlaps. Um, 
even uh, when I consider, if you consider feature clustering and classification, there are also connections uh, if you consider the, the, uh, the manifold uh, assumption that all the high dimension data can be represented lower dimension data and they should naturally give you the clustering based on the grouping, all the labels, um, in a sense, um, like representation or um, uh, like follow such uh, assumption in order to make the learning work. So yeah, I agree there over less. Okay, I think I have time for maybe one more question. Um, so speaking about info NCE, um, somebody wants a bit of clarification on the geometric in in interpretation that this method spreads representations uniformly across the hypersphere. So maybe why is that a useful inductive bias? Sure. Um, so the basic idea is that the dissimilar samples, so um, the negative samples, uh, uh, the info NC loss will uh, make the angle between those two embedding vectors larger. So it's kind of like the electrons that are spread in the spherical conductor where they repulse each other. And in the similar intuition, it becomes kind of uniformly spread across the hypersphere uh, when the majority of the pairs are negative. And you're doing so while uh, connecting the positive samples into similar regions in the hypersphere. So that's kind of the geometric intuitions around it. I hope that answered. Yeah, nice, nice explanation. Okay, I think I have actually time for one more. So um, somebody is asking specifically about out of distribution generalization. So um, maybe there are some downstream tasks which are more OD than others. Does self-supervised learning and then fine tuning give a better out of distribution generalization performance than just supervised learning? Or is it um, similar to the improvement that we'd expect from the, the benefit that we already get from, from using the stronger representation from self-supervised learning? Uh, I actually think uh, all different learning uh, paradigm, like uh, pertaining about self-supervised learning or supervised learning or <laughs> semi-supervised learning and fine tuning, I, I actually think all those approach can be or should be uh, addictive meaning if there is a way for you to apply all of them and improve your task. Uh, but improvements might, some of them might be small, some of them bigger, it depends on your task and the available of your data set. And for out of distribution generalization, um, I would suggest if you have a lot of unlabeled data in the target domain, try to use them um, for pre-training or try to use them, um, um, uh, uh, sorry. If you don't have, you don't even have all label data in the target domain, try to collect more of those data by using either certain models trained on a small set of target domain data or using embeddings. Um, it always helps and all those approach are not necessary to contradict each other. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Zhang Wook and Lillian. Uh, I think that's all that we have for a second Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll be having a, another Q&A at the end of the tutorial session. So please join us then with your questions in the Rocket Chat. Thank you.
Now let's look into how these approaches are applied to other modalities than vision. I should extend the pretext tasks that we discussed to video. Since video is just a series of images, most image pretext tasks can be applied directly to video frames, but the additional time dimension allows us to extract more information such as the position and speed of moving objects and information on the three-dimensional scene learnable from different camera angles. Let's review how recent self-supervised models on video uh, approaches this task. A traditional way to process video is to follow the optical flow of the video to identify moving objects. Those can then be used for contrastive learning using the triplet laws shown on the left or segmenting objects in videos by grouping different flows into, in the region. Video representations learned by these models were then used for transferring to other video tasks like object detection or action classification. Another source of self-supervision that can be extracted from videos is the sequential ordering of the frames in the video. In temporal order verification by Misra et al. in 2016, as well as Fernando et al. in 2017, the model classifies whether a sequence of video frames are in the correct order or incorrect temporal order. The arrow of time model introduced in 2018 is trained for a similar task classifying whether the sequence is moving forward or backward in time and outperform the temporal order verification models. This work applies a clever idea to perform object tracking on videos by learning to colorize objects in a grayscale input frame by copying the colors in a reference frame. To do so, the model has to learn to recognize objects and their motions in video frames. The trained model can then be used for video segmentation and human pose estimation in a predictive setting. Interestingly, this can be done in a zero-shot manner without any additional training because the model can move the colored markings in the labeled input image directly in the prediction. Multi-view learning objectives use videos of the same objects taken from different camera angles based on the idea that at the same timestamp of a multi-camera stream, views will have similar embedding compared to the views at a different timestamp. Time contrasted networks and its extension multi-frame TCN learn video representations using contrastive losses such as the triplet and n pair loss on matching and non-matching time frames in the videos. Because video files are huge, generating coherent continuations of video has been a difficult task. Recent models from DeepMind, as well as UC Berkeley, tackles this task by first learning to discretize the video into latent codes using uh, VQVAE, and then learning to auto-regressively generate the frames using Pixel CNN or Transformers. As you've seen in the previous slide, Combining VQVAE and autoregressive models to generate high-dimensional data results in a very powerful generative model. Jukebox takes a similar approach applied to music. It works by learning at three different levels of VQVAEs with different compression ratios, resulting in a sequence of discrete code at each level. It is then used to generate new music or continuations of music by hierarchically sampling the latent codes and then applying the VQVAE decoder to the bottom level codes. The music representation learned by Jukebox has proven to be very powerful in a number of downstream tasks. Castellon et al. used Jukebox representation for MIR tasks such as uh, genre and emotion prediction on music, as well as music tagging, and achieved state-of-the-art among models trained for specific tasks. Tagbox by Manilo et al. 
performs source suppression by steering the jukebox latent space to be classified with a certain label, such as voice, by a music tagging model. Various contrastive learning methods for audio have also been introduced. Among them are contrastive learning for audio, or COLA, which predicts a pair of uh, encoded features are from the same recording or not. The multi-format audio contrastive learning framework is learned by maximizing agreement between features encoded from the raw waveform and the spe spectrogram formats. Self-supervised representation learning on audio has been widely successful in automatic speech recognition. A prominent example is wave 2 back 2.0 from FAIR, which applies a contrastive loss on the representation of mask portion of the audio to learn discrete tokens from them. Uh, speech recognition models trained on these tokens as inputs have shown better performance compared to those trained on conventional audio features or directly from raw audio. And it has been integrated to state-of-the-art speech recognition models from Google as well, such as SpeechC or Big SSL. A more recent approach, Hubert, again from FAIR, is learned by alternating between an offline K-means clustering step and optimizing for cluster assignment prediction, similar to how deep cluster works. Hubert performs state-of-the-art in ASR performance and is also used for speech synthesis. There are uh, lots of ways to do self-supervised learning on multimodal data, although the definition of self-supervised learning gets kind of blurry here, depending on whether you consider a multimodal data set as single unlabeled data set, or as if one modality gives supervision to another modality. Assuming that they can be classified as self-supervised learning in a broad sense, here we give just a few examples. The MILNCE model is trained contrastively to find matching narration with video, which can not only use for correcting misalignment in videos, but also for action recognition, text to video retrieval, action localization, and action segmentation. The clip and align model, which Lillian introduced earlier, are another example of self-supervised learning, in this case, connecting the modalities of language and images. Now Lillian will introduce self-supervised learning for language. Next, uh, let's check out the pretext tasks in the natural language domain. You may have been quite familiar with many large pre-trained language models like uh, GPT and BERT. Uh, I will say they changed the landscape of NLP research quite a lot in recent years. They, they can all be considered as a self-supervised uh, model um, given a massive collection of unlabeled free text. The models only depend on the natural order of words and sequences. Uh, there are a bunch of um, different pretext tasks are designed in different language models um, as listed here. Let's check out what they are uh, one by one. First is GPT model. GPT model is quite simple. It's only doing next token prediction in an autoregressive fashion. Differently, BERT as a bidirectional transformer model it has pretext tasks on mask language modeling, MLI, and next sentence prediction, NSP. NSP is to train a binary classifier for telling whether one sentence is the next sentence of the other. Albert adopted a sentence order prediction, SOP, um, as um, into its uh, as its additional like self-supervised uh, loss, where in SOP, positive pair or positive sample is a pair of two consecutive segments from the same document. A negative sample is same as above, but um, with the segment order switched. Uh, 
Electron introduced a new pre-chain uh, pretext task called replace the token prediction, RT, RTD. Oh, sorry. Um, it should be replace token detection, uh, where random tokens are replaced and considered corrected. In parallel, a binary, uh, a simple binary discriminator is trained. Uh, together with the generative language model to predict whether each token has been replaced. There is a long history in learning a low dimensional representation of text. Uh, here we have skip thought vector le learns to predict the sentences based on other sentences around it. The idea is very similar to skip gram. Um, models for learning word embedding, but it just applied on sentence instead. Quick thought vector use um, a contrastive learning setup and aims to identify the correct context sentence among other contrastive candidates. Um, it's um, the, uh, the positive and negative samples are constructed also based on the context, like the orders of sentences. Next, um, the we uh, as we look more into recent work on um, sentence embedding, I would say the majority of bird derived sentence encoder rely on supervised data set, like uh, NLI data set, natural language inference. But they there exist some. Uh, unsupervised models for learning sentence embeddings, like uh, info sentence bird adopted a self-supervised learning object based on mutual information maximization. Same CSE proposed to use dropout as data augmentation for creating multiple augmented version of the text input. A sample is simply fed into the encoder twice with different dropout masks. And then these two augmented data points form a positive pair where the other in batch samples are considered as negative ones. Same as uh, same CSE has an optional MLM mask language modeling auxiliary last to help it avoid a catastrophic forgetting of token level knowledge. Same CSE also can work with uh, supervised labels. And it actually adopts um, adding the supervised signal from an NLI actually improve uh, its benchmark result quite a bit. Most of models for uh, learning sentence embeddings rely on supervised NLI data set, uh, as I mentioned earlier, such as sentence bird, bird flow. Uh, whitening sentence bird, like there are different technologies applied to normalize embedding space to make it more isotrophic. Unsupervised sentence embedding models, like uh, unsupervised, the same as we still have a, a quite noticeable performance gap with the supervised version. So uh, I, I do think we have some some work to do there to catch up. Next, we're going to review a couple training techniques in order to achieve better performance with self-supervised learning, especially uh, contrastive learning, which has gained a lot of attraction in recent years. And many papers show that large-scale contrastive learning can achieve very, uh, very good uh, results in terms of transfer performance. First, we're going to look into data, data augmentation techniques. Proper data augmentation is critical for learning good and generalizable embedding features. It introduces the non-essential distortion into training samples without modifying semantic meanings and thus encourages the model to learn the essential part within the representation. We will look into augmentation techniques for images and text, respectively. They are for image augmentation. They are a wide collection of basic image distortion operations, including 
uh, random cropping and the resize, back to the original size or uh, random color distortion, Gaussian blur, jittering, color jittering, uh, or convert the image to grayscale, random flip or rotation, and, and many more. Mm. Of course, um, given those basic operations, you can always combine multiple um, basic ones together, leading to a more complicated distortion strategy. This leads to the our next question of what's the best augmentation strategy given um, so many options, so many uh, potential combinations. We're gonna look into four examples here. Uh, first, auto augment. It was inspired by neural architecture search. It frames the problem of learning best the data augmentation strategy for image classification as a reinforcement learning task and looks for the combination that leads to the highest accuracy on the evaluation set. Rand Augment greatly reduced the search space of uh, auto augment, uh, which is actually very, very expensive uh, in its initial, uh, initial implementation. By uh, Rand Augment control the magnitude of different transformation operation with a single uh, multitude parameter, so reduce the search uh, space. Population-based augmentation, uh, PBA, combines uh, population-based training with auto-augment. So instead of RL, it uses the evolutionary algorithm to train a population of children models in parallel to evolve the best augmentation strategies. Unsupervised Data Augment, UDA, selected augmentation strategy to minimize the KL divergence between the predicted distribution over an unlabeled example and its augmented version. Um, third, um, third, uh, uh, third style of image augmentation is image mixture. It refers to a way to fuse multiple image into a sing single one. You basically create new samples um, based on existing ones. Um, but instead of using a single image, uh, you, you would take multiple ones as input. For example, mixed up does global level mixture by creating a weighted pixel-wise combination of two existing images. Cut mix does region level mixture. A new model is created by combining a local region of one image with the rest of the other image. Mixing of contrastive hard negative, uh, short for mochi, explicitly maintains a queue of um, some number of uh, negative samples sorted by similarity to the query in descending order. So the initial, like, uh, the first couple samples in the queue should be the hardest negative samples. Then new hard negative can be created by weighting mix, mixing images in this queue um, together or even with the query. For text augmentation, the most intuitive approach is to apply lexicon based uh, edits. Just changing the words or tokens. Easy data augmentation, EDA, uh, defines a set of simple but efficient operations, including synonym replacement, random insertion, swap, or deletion. Contextual augmentation does synonym replacement, um, but instead of relying on like predefined list of synonyms, it try to find the replacement words using a bidirectional language model such as BERT. Back translation is a technique to distort one sentence by first translating it to another language and then translating back to the original one. Well, um, in this process, uh, of course, it depends on the quality of your translation model. The semantic meaning should stay largely unchanged. For example, here I use uh, I have a sentence, I like eating white peaches, 
I use Google Translate, translate it to Korean first, and then back to English. Uh, you can see the meanings are the same, but they're like a small wording difference. In this way, we get augmented version of the of the uh, sentence while keep the semantic meaning same. Uh, various in this process, you can use a, a variety of uh, translation models for different languages. Um, once we have a, a, a noisy version of text samples, many contrastive learning framework introduced above, such as like MoCo, SimsLM, BOL, can be used to learn um, sentence embedding, just, just as how they apply to images. Next, uh, for text augmentation, uh, we're going to talk about dropout and cutoff. So dropout is a quite universal way to apply transformation on any input. Same CSV uses dropout to create different copies of the same text. Um, it's, um, it's universal because um, it actually doesn't require your uh, expert knowledge about the the attributes of this input modality it is uh, changes on the architecture level cutoff augmentation for text can be applied to different dimensions of the data such as masking random selected tokens removing a few feature columns or removing a continuous chunk of text Next, next, we're going to talk about um, hard negative mining. Um, it is a very important technique for um, contrastive learning. Hard negative mining aims to find challenging negative samples. Um, those um, and challenging negative samples should have different labels from anchor data points, but have embedding features very close to the to the anchor embedding. They are very important in contrastive learning because they encourage a model to to capture the the most essential feature to distinguish hard negative from true positive. We for explicit hard negative mining um, for learning good sentence embedding, many model uh, like uh, sentence embedding, especially like sentence encoder, sentence embedding models, turn to natural language inference data set. There, uh, there are a couple options for uh, like relatively large labeled NL data set available, and they treat the contradiction pairs as hard negative. And hard negative samples with shared keywords. Um, can be found um, by classic information retrieval models like uh, EM25. Um, they usually implement it based on TF IDIF, um, but they won't go beyond um, keyword matching. We can also use the similarity score between the negative sample and anchor as a proxy to upweight negative samples with high similarity. Mochi, which we have introduced earlier, explicitly track negative samples and store them by similarity score in descending order. Implicit hard negative mining happens as, as long as your, your batch size is large enough. Most recent contrastive learning work uh, use in-batch negative samples rather than explicitly keep track of them. Memory bank, uh, initially proposed by, um, uh, I think, uh, contrastive instant inst uh, learning and, and MoCo, it helps increase the batch size in explicitly, but it becomes less a necessity because large training batch size in explicitly encourage hard negative mining. Virus training parallel. Uh, Parallelism techniques for large neural networks across many GPUs are also making fast progress, which make it possible to use very large batch size learning training. Next, we briefly cover recent theoretical studies on self-supervised learning, mainly focusing on contrastive learning. 
this so just let us understand a little more on why these approaches work the way they do and shed some light on the future directions. The contrastive predictive coding paper proved that the info and CE loss is a lower bound to uh, the mutual information between the embedding from the two views. So by minimizing the info and CE loss, the encoders are optimizing the embedding space to retain as much information as possible that existed between the two views. This is the InfoMax principle in contrastive learning. And recall that the types of views are modeling choices that we can decide on, as we have seen in contrastive learning methods where augmentations are crucial for the performance. A question that naturally follows is, how can we design good views? Yong Long Tian and others in Philip Isola's group studied this question and introduced the InfoMean principle. To perform well in transfer learning, we would want our model to capture the mutual information between the data, x, and the downstream label, y, shown on the slide as i of x, y. If the mutual information between the views is smaller than i of x, y, the model would fail to capture useful information for the downstream tasks. Meanwhile, if the mutual information between the views are too large, it would have access information that is unrelated to the downstream task. So the transfer performance would decrease due to the noise. Their studies verified that there exists a sweet spot between the two paradigms, which they call the minimal sufficient encoder. And they experimented with various degrees of noise in their augmentation to show this. This implies that the optimal views are dependent on the downstream tasks. Related work by Tsai et al. proposed a composite loss that helps converging to a minimal sufficient encoder. Another study from the same group focused on the geometry of contrastively learned embeddings, where they demonstrated that features learned with a contrastive objective is more uniformly distributed in the embedding space compared to a randomly initialized network or a network trained with supervised learning. They also measured the alignment, measuring how close the distance between features from two views of the same input is, and showed that contrastive learning results in better alignment than supervised learning. In more recent work, Hua et al. showed that Dimensional collapse in contrastive learning is possible, where learned features span lower dimensional subspace instead of using the full, full dimensionality. In a study by Jing et al., two causes for the dimensional collapse are suggested, which are strong augmentation while creating the views and implicit regularization caused by the gradient descent dynamics. There is a line of research studying provable guarantees about contrastive learning. Aurora et al. in 2019 showed that contrastive learning helped decrease the sample complexity, and Lee et al. in 2020 showed that predicting known information in the data also helps decrease the sample complexity. Tosh et al. showed that in contrastively learned representations, Linear classifiers are nearly optimal for downstream tasks. Houghton et al. proposed a contrastive learning objective based on a spectral decomposition of the augmentation graph called spectral contrastive learning and showed a better performance than SIMCRR and SIMCM. All in all, theoretical studies on self-supervised learning have provided valuable insights but as is the case with deep learning in general, they are very much ongoing work and we are yet to see an Isaac Newton moment for deep learning. Now back to Lillian, who will discuss future directions and conclude this tutorial. Okay, uh, in the future direction session, we will briefly discuss a few 
open research questions and promise uh, and a couple promising um, um, like uh, areas of work to look into if you're interested in self-supervised learning. First of all, we believe large batch size will be a critical factor. It leads to strong improvements on transfer performance and at the same time helps reduce the complexity of hard negative mining. Large data set will also be important. The natural of self-supervised learning has enabled us to make use of uh, a lot more data beyond labeled samples, but we still consistently observe the importance of large clean corpus. One idea is to use synthetic data. For example, uh, if you have image-based RL task, you can easily render different views of the same object, uh, object in your simulator. And theoretically, you can generate infinite amount of data that way. At the same time, we should not forget about better control over data quality through either filtration or active learning. Finding, in, finding better way um, to use internet data would be also important too, uh, to scale up the data set size. Um, since that, like, the internet collects activities and data generated by millions of, sorry, billions of internet users, it has a massive volumes and they're just sitting there and keep on growing every day. Okay, um, next one is about uh, the importance of negative sample selection. Although I talked about uh, how large batch size can help uh, do, can help do hard negative mining in, in explicitly, it might not be enough because the batch size <laughs> cannot go to infinity. And they're always a boundary restricted by um, your, your compute resources, uh, your hardware limitation. S smart, efficient, and scalable methods for finding hard and negative samples will consistently benefit the training for um, like contrastive learning models. There is also a trend uh, a trend to combine multiple text tasks together. Then the question becomes how to combine them and what would be the best strategy to combine. Continue. Um, I would like to emphasize on uh, data augmentation tricks. It has a very critical impact on the quality of the models, but it still feel a bit ad hoc. Many, many data augmentation techniques have been proposed to apply to different forms of the impasse. Like you pick certain operation based on the modality, like for image, you can do this, for text, you can do that. But most of them are handcrafted by human and they're specific to this, this, this specific modality. We will need more insights into theoretical foundation on why certain augmentation works better than others to guide us to find more uh, efficient data augmentation techniques. We, we will also need to improve training efficiency as self-supervised learning methods have been pushing the deep learning arms race, uh, the increase of model size and training batch size leads to increase the cost both economically and environmentally. Last, we would like to suggest some more work in measuring uh, and mitigating social bias in the embedding space, either from the perspective of model training or reducing the bias up some in the training data set. I mean, there are uh, quite some work in the word embedding space, um, but the problem could be different and in, in, in the sentence uh, embedding problem. Okay, um, that's the end of our tutorial. Thank you so much for staying this long and please feel free to ask your questions. Thanks. Welcome. Welcome back to the online session where we're gonna be answering your questions that you asked during the talk. 
Uh, we are live. Uh, now it's actually 10, 14 p.m. New York City time. And wherever you are, welcome again back to this session. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be starting with the first question here, which is going to be uh, just, you know, it seems like, say, seems, seems like a little bit of magic. This batch normalization comes into play every time. And so we start with this one, actually. Uh, can you speak about the importance of batch normalization for contrastive learning, right? It seems that with that, things work. Without, things may not work all the time. So what do we say? For uh, when we're talking about batch norm in contrastive learning, uh, my immediate thought is with um, BYOL. Um, I believe um, the that's a very um, surprising case in my opinion that it doesn't work with negative sampling. Uh, sorry, negative samples. And the reason being, um, they apply the batch normalization and usually in contrast learning, incorporating negative samples will help the model to avoid a mode collab. Like if you just learn exactly same representation for all the samples, you can easily trivially uh, minimize the loss. Um, in BYOL, um, adding batch normalization actually help preventing this um, mode collab um, because um, if, if you have uh, a bunch of sample go through the model and predict very similar representation, you apply batch normalization, you actually spread out um, the distribution and, and, and avoid that um, maybe same zero prediction for everything. Um, so I do see batch normalization being important there. Um, but once you incorporate negative samples, I do feel batch normalization, it's more like uh, a standard um, techniques for better or stabilize the training. And um, it's like a trick in, in the training or in the architecture design. Um, but yeah, um, honestly speaking, a lot of um, improvements in the architecture or training strategy feels a bit like engineering, <laughs> engineering checks. Um, yeah, so these are empirical, right? Our, yeah. our field is an empirical field. And then we just try things and we find what works, what doesn't work. Then mm -hmm. the theory will come late, later, like when we start mm -hmm. making uh, planes fly, right? We start making them mm -hmm. fly and then we come up with aerodynamics and all those things, right? So now it works, we use it, then maybe understanding will come maybe <laughs> in, a, in a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, there's a question here, which is actually recurring uh, several times, which is about this uh, batch, batch size, right? So how large should it be? Why uh, a large batch size implies uh, hard negative mining? Uh, how, how, how large should be for Bert and Roberta? So there are like several uh, questions are asking basically, uh, uh, you know, there are doubts and questions about the batch size. Let's, let's say something more about this, perhaps. Well, the intuitive uh, answer to that is if you're not using any um, momentum or memory band, um, it helps uh, the larger batch size, it's the better. Um, and for example, for the clip model, we use uh, 32,768 batch size. And um, going back to the electron in the spherical conductor example, um, if you have uh, more number of electrons that are um, repelling each other in the sphere uh, and especially in the high first sphere, it has a lot more surface area and it'll definitely help um, spreading out the distribution of factors um, if you have large batch sizes um, more uniformly. Um, if that's the intuition and for a uh, BERT or other models, um, yeah, it's basically doing the uh, that's, it's basically doing the uh, repulsion between the vocabulary size, which is also in the order of tens of thousands. And that's uh, one another thing to consider where if it's the cross entropy loss is over uh, the categorical distribution that has larger than the size, it, the, the current GPU modules tend to break down and become slower. And yeah, so that's another like, caveat in selecting that size. 
Also, a, another softball, since we are talking about the batch size, why is a larger batch, shi batch size a implicit hard mining, right? Let's actually clarify this for who didn't get at this point. Uh, when you have a lot of sample in the batch, uh, naturally you will have higher chance to capture harder uh, samples. It's just simple math, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, let's state, right? It's simple, I guess, mm -hmm. for, but then if we don't say it, maybe it just, you know, flies away without being uh, said. Um, we have another question here. It's maybe interesting. Uh, isn't vector quantization uh, maybe going against the idea of contrastive uh, self-similarity of vectors? The latter requires continuous vector to calculate a discrete similarity score. Is that uh, I think it's some, somewhat true. Um, by definition, vector quantization's output is quantized discrete codes, and it doesn't work well with the continuous influence or, or other contrastive based loss. And um, yeah, the reason why we introduce vector quantization in some generative models is that it makes the modeling of uh, the distribution, um, for example, the auto regressive re distribution of words or um, some. In case of jukebox, it uh, predicts the next token, the discrete representation of some audio. And in general, uh, modeling those categorical distribution discreetly is easier than modeling whatever continuous distribution. So that allows us to make the VQGAN or other VQ-based models. Um, and while uh, contrastive approaches can be combined with other parts of the model that can be uh, that's using uh, VQ, it's uh, true that it's not directly um, able to combine with those two. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Uh, then there is a question that is kind of sensitive, as in uh, applies to what I'm doing now in research, which is a, it's very painful. I'm, I'm going to ask you because, again, it's um, we don't know the answer, but we have to say we don't know the answer to this question, which is, how do we interpret the transformations that are applied to contrastive learning? Is, it, is there any intuition behind it in a, or is it just an empirical ablation? Uh, is it merely including invariances against them and they, and they turn out to be helpful? So how do we come up with these, these transformations? Is there any theory behind it? Uh, why we use them, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, actually, we had a similar question in the first TA section. Um, but again, um, I will emphasize <laughs> again that this is an interesting question and we do need more work uh, on it um, to reiterate or reemphasize something I mentioned earlier, um, applying a certain augmentation, especially hand curated augmentation um, it's a way for experts to, like we humans, to introduce certain inductive bias into the model uh, into, in, in terms of the form of the data. Um, for example, uh, if um, we uh, distort the color, drop the color, uh, the model will know, okay, color doesn't matter in, no, in order for me to tell whether this is a cat or a dog. So that's like a give model advantage of learning something with fewer destruction, fewer information. Um, this would not always work because if your downstream task is to predict what's the color of the stock or cat. So it's possible there will be a mismatch between your chosen augmentation and the downstream task. Um, that's why some people uh, play with uh, automated augmentation strategies, like let the algorithm to learn what's the best to the downstream task. But again, there, there is a risk that you're gonna overfit to the downstream task. Um, so in order, um, I mean, we can apply learned augmentation strategy, maybe to a family of tasks, to, to a, a diverse selection of tasks that could potentially work as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to figure out in future research. 
Uh, another question, which is really uh, painful, I guess. I mean, I like painful questions, right? Because it makes sense that we are here for addressing these that are questions that researchers and we are facing every day, right? So an another one, another hot, hot one. Um, how data hungry are these models, right? What is the order of magnitude? Uh, how much data is minimum, right? So how much do we actually need? And also I add one more question, right? Because it's related. How large this model needs to be in order to leverage these statistics of unable data, right? So w w we have to state, right? What is the main major difficulty, let's say ma major challenge, let's call it challenge, right? What is the major challenge here, right? So how much data, how large the model, how much compute we need to be able to train these self-supervised models? Um, here we need to, I think, we need to consider the backstory, uh, why um, in the beginning we uh, kind of started to do self-supervised self learning. It's uh, because uh, the, there's a limit in the labeled data set uh, that we can collect. So we kind of wanted to get supervision from the data itself. And uh, so it really starts to make sense uh, for larger data set than its typical uh, supervised data set. So that's usually a couple of millions for ImageNet and uh, not larger than a few hundred million. And that will um, yeah, be calculated to, to the corresponding model size and compute size. Um, yeah, that's the rule of thumb. And I guess I, I'll st stop here because we're over time. All right, so let me actually uh, finish up by giving a small recap of why we care, right? So why we care about self-supervised learning. So with supervised learning, uh, we're gonna have stochastic gradient in the sand that allows us to move away from our initialization point. How far can we go from the initialization point? As much as we have labels. And we have a finite am amount of labels because labels are expensive, right? And then the solution, stochastic gradient descent finds, is gonna be very connected to the initialization point. So how can we find a better minima, right? We can find a better minimum by starting at a different location. How do we find that better location? By using self-supervised learning. So self-supervised learning allows us, allows us to start from a better starting point. Then we do a hop, hop, hop. We just do a few hops down. And then where do we end up? If we end up in a shallow minima, we are going to be escaping that thing because this stochastic gradient, boom, 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 makes like ping pong as outside this thing until we go ploof in a very large uh, minima, right? And so this is like the visual way I like to think about uh, SGD, no? For supervised learning. And then the self-supervised learning allows us to start a, from in a, better, in a better location, right? And that's why we were here all interested about this topic. And also Lillian has a very nice uh, blog that we should all check on her, uh, on her webpage, right? What's the link here? We have the Lil, Lil blog, right? It's called. So we want to talk about that, right? Why not? And also if you have more questions that we haven't addressed, right? You can just write them on directly on, on Twitter. We are all like, we are all there talking and helping and trying to share what we, the little we know, right? With, I mean, the little I know at least with all of you, right? So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, have a nice good night or whatever day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being with us and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>